Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Criminology in Context, Behind the Line, an insider's look at the world of law enforcement. Thank you for joining us today. I am the college's Graduate Student Association President, Eric Connolly, and my co-host is Jennifer Brown from the Alumni and Friends of Criminology. And for those of you who are new to our Criminology in Context speaker series, this is a joint effort between GSA and the Alumni and Friends of Criminology to provide a platform where accomplished alumni and friends of the college can impart their practical knowledge and experiences from their criminology-related professions so in order to connect the concepts related, learned in the classroom with current issues in the field. The discussion panel today will focus specifically on current issues in law enforcement, steps students can be taking to prepare themselves for a career in the field, and how to advance to leadership positions. We are lucky to have three individuals with us today who can speak from both a practical and academic perspective on these issues. Our panel includes Tallahassee Community College President, Dr. Jim Murdaugh, Senator Steve Ulrich from Florida District 14, and our very own Dean Tom Blomberg. In just a minute, we ask that each of these gentlemen introduce themselves to you, provide a bit of information on their background. Our panel discussion will then involve a series of questions regarding a range of topics. At the end of our program, we will take questions from the audience. Following the open question portion, we invite you to join us and our panelists in the lobby for Cookies and Punch. Again, thank you for joining us today. And without further ado, I'll ask each of these fine gentlemen to introduce themselves and get a little, a little bit of background information. Uh, Dr. Murdoch, would you like to begin? Uh, well, thank you very much. And uh, welcome to all of you. Thank you for taking the time to be here. Um, I currently serve as the sixth president of Tallahassee Community College. But uh, many are surprised to find that I began my career as a deputy sheriff. I uh, started here in Leon County as a deputy sheriff, worked my way up to the rank of lieutenant with uh, the sheriff's office, and had the privilege of performing a number of different functions uh, at the sheriff's office. Left there, became assistant chief of police in Fort Walton Beach, served a stint as the interim chief of police there, and then came back to Tallahassee, where I was served in state government, including uh, 11 years with the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. Uh, left there in 1999 to moved to Tallahassee Community College to begin to take over the academy function there and grow it to what it is today, the Florida Public Safety Institute. Uh, and during that period of time, sort of broadened and, and got involved in the education parts of the college, particularly in workforce education, because that's what we did at the academy, was give people credentials to get jobs as law enforcement officers and firefighters and corrections officers. Um, when the, my predecessor left TCC uh, to take the job as president of St. Pete College. Uh, I applied for this job and was fortunate enough to get it. So my path here to becoming a college president is very unusual, uh, but my heart and my roots are in law enforcement. So I enjoy the opportunity to be here with you today. Senator Ulrich. Okay. I'm Steve Ulrich. Um, I am uh, currently uh, the senator for state senator for District 14, which uh, entails uh, kind of north central Florida, uh, Lake City, Ocala, Gainesville, those sorts of areas. Uh, I am a 1970 graduate of uh, the criminology program at Florida State University. Uh, prior to that, I was a uniformed police officer down in St. Petersburg, Florida. I was, a, you know, graduated from the first time they ever combined all the uh, law enforcement agencies in Pinellas County, and uh, but I, I wanted to further my education, so I came up here to uh, to Tallahassee and to FSU to get a degree in criminology. Um, you know, um, after that, I, I joined, uh, or during that time, I joined uh, the Florida Department of Law Enforcement and was a uh, uh, got promoted to special agent upon my graduation and got sent down to, I got promoted to Miami, which I claim was a oxymoron, but they didn't see it that way. So I uh, went down to Miami. I worked in Miami uh, uh, primarily on organized crime intelligence, did a lot of undercover work, not only in uh, Miami and South Florida, but to include uh, the Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico and places like that. Uh, after I did that, I came back uh, after uh, Miami to Tallahassee uh, was uh, trained, had been trained as a homicide investigator, so I worked a lot of homicides uh, all throughout North Central Florida, where primarily in smaller counties where they didn't have a, uh, let's say, an accomplished uh, crime laboratory uh, uh, facility or uh, 
uh, investigative uh, facility. We're talking uh, years ago. Uh, things are improved drastically since the time I used to run the road between all around the Big Bend area and work on, uh, oh, by the way, we got a body on the side of the road. Can you please come and help us uh, find out first who it is and uh, them was the ones what done it, you know. Uh, so I did that for uh, many years. I got transferred over to uh, to uh, Gainesville, was working over there. Um, those of you may know that there's another university over in Gainesville. Uh, and and so I worked over there, and, and then I had about, about as much fun in law enforcement as I could possibly stand. So I dropped out of law enforcement, and I entered the business world. I worked 10 years and ran an insurance agency for 10 years. But I had the hankering, uh, uh, as Dr. Murdoch can tell you, that uh, for the it gets in your blood and you, you kind of have a hankering. But I wanted to go back in a leadership position, so I ran for uh, sheriff of Alachua County, uh, Gainesville, and uh, was uh, shocked uh, when I won. My first official act was to uh, demand a recount, but they told me, in fact, I had won. So uh, I went from there. There's a, uh, uh, a begrudging uh, slogan over there for many years. I was the sheriff there for 14 years, and they said that with all those gators over there, they needed a FSU criminology graduate to keep them under control. <laughs> so I tried to do that as best I could for 14 years. Uh, after 14 years, uh, I, uh, uh, I was approached to uh, run for the state senate from that area, I did that, and so I got elected to uh, the state senate uh, here about almost six years ago, uh, and I sit as chairman of the uh, Higher Education Committee. Uh, somehow, uh, nobody uh, checked on my FSU transcript before they put me as chairman of higher education, but be that as it may, I am here, and uh, of course, I am a strong advocate for uh, uh, law enforcement for the office of sheriff for uh, uh, you know the strong uh, presence of law enforcement and I'm very uh, uh, involved in trying to to get to uh, make law enforcement a profession uh, you know the years ago back in the 60s when I uh, first became involved in law enforcement uh, because when I was a little kid when I was 13 or 14 years old I knew I wanted to be a, a cop I wanted to be in law enforcement uh, to uh, serve other people and, uh, you know, kind of do all those kind of things and, we, quite frankly, wanted to uh, uh, have a uh, career with some excitement and, um, and uh, be involved in things that ordinarily people uh, would not get involved in. And, boy, howdy, did I get my fair share of that. Uh, so I was involved in law enforcement for 30 years, but I can tell you right now that uh, I don't know if we're any closer to professionalization of law enforcement in the realm that uh, registered nurses or certainly doctors and lawyers or not. There's been no real requirement for education other than a high school diploma for uh, law enforcement people uh, since I started in law enforcement. And so I'm an advocate for uh, to expand uh, the requirements for education for law enforcement, people entering the field of law enforcement now more than ever. Uh, the job has only gotten more and more complex and complicated. Uh, as we, as the years have gone by, not less. Uh, but somehow there's been a resistance, uh, kind of a general resistance, I say, to uh, requiring uh, college for law enforcement people, uh, either two-year degree or four-year degree. But uh, I had it when I was sheriff that if you wanted to be a sergeant with the Alachua County Sheriff's Office, you had to have a two-year degree. And if you wanted to be a lieutenant with the Alachua County Sheriff's Office, you had to have a four-year degree and you had to move around the agency and experience different jobs. So I still feel strongly about that uh, law enforcement uh, should be a profession. I'm going to work very hard uh, with uh, the dean here to uh, see if I can make that come true at uh, not only at uh, Florida State University, but uh, throughout the education, higher education system in the state of Florida. And I will tell you that Florida's, uh, e even at that, is head and shoulders ab above most states in the union. And Dean Bomberg? Oh, uh, well, again, welcome everyone. And I normally see you when you come in, and then I shake your hand as you walk across the auditorium there and uh, receive your degree. So it's nice to have a, a kind of an in-between opportunity to share uh, uh, this, uh, these moments and the expertise of this fine panel. Uh, my background is from California. My education was at a place called Berkeley. Uh, 
I started out in civil engineering, but there was the Vietnam War and there was uh, civil disobedience and things that I was watching on television. And civil engineering didn't seem that relevant to a lot of the things that were going on. And uh, so I drifted over to that south side of campus and took some courses called sociology and sort of got hooked. And I wrote my honors thesis on prisonization. And uh, I was uh, sold on criminology at that point. And so I entered the uh, graduate program at Berkeley and got a master's and doctorate in criminology. And in 1973, I came to Florida State, uh, drove a Volkswagen here with my wife and son. We'd just seen the movie Deliverance. And I was a little concerned about moving across the country into the Deep South. I had a lot of, uh, uh, I guess, superstitious notions about the South. Uh, I think it was the best move we could have made. Uh, I've now been here for 38 years. I've seen the college grow, develop, and I think we're at a point now that we're uh, at our most exciting stage. We're on a trajectory that, just like this panel, is where we're really, indeed, trying to bring our research, our theory, our empirical knowledge into the public policy realm like no other time before. And uh, so I'm very, very excited about the prospects. Uh, I think it's very important for the education of each of you to, to be able to have this opportunity to hear from the experts, to hear from, uh, from this panel, for example, uh, people that have gone through, have gotten the education, have gone out, uh, have really climbed all the way up and have experienced impediments, have had success, and to hear just what those experiences are. Uh, you do face, again, as Senator Ulrich just pointed out, unprecedented challenges. I think uh, we cannot educate you good enough. We can't make you cri your critical thinking. We can't make it too good. We can't make your writing skills too good. You face challenges that none of us faced, quite frankly. And so I think getting into a program like you're in, pushing yourself, really learning, and again, getting beyond the classroom, uh, attending events like this, making contact, uh, contacts, networking, and so on, that has to be a part of your comprehensive education. And you need to keep questioning where you're going. Is that where you want to go, and so on. And I think these types of panels and these types of activities really do give you firsthand uh, information. Thank you. Thank you, panelists. Uh, now for the first question of the panel discussion. Criminal justice-related television shows often use heinous crimes such as murder, rape, and pedophilia for their plot lines. What effect do you feel these shows have on the community's perception and or fear of crime? What should be the role of law enforcement and public policy makers in combating these perceptions and fears? Yeah, that's right. yeah we like that. Do we, is this a volunteer basis? Is that? A, uh, that yeah, sure. Okay. <laughs> well, I'll go. Uh, well, I, you know, that's, I say that's um, uh, traditionally uh, uh, law enforcement work and, and, and police work, if you want to call it that, has traditionally been a kind of a focus for the entertainment industry uh, ever since I can remember. And this goes back to Western days and the mm -hmm. whole, you know, the ideas of the, uh, and, and basically I would think that Generally, a law enforcement is characterized as the protagonist uh, in these uh, struggles that you see. Not always. It's the style of how they, what they uh, are trying to tell you that being a, a police officer is all about. It's uh, extremely uh, glamorized and uh, not very realistic, but at the same token, it, it, it it's, gives you a, 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 an excitement and adventure to know more. And what I say by that is I say that most of the actors that play law enforcement uh, people wouldn't make a good pimple on a law enforcement person's rear end, but uh, they are um, not the kind of people. What I was always trying to look at for a sheriff, I, I, I have a, ran a medium-sized uh, sheriff's office. Uh, I had about 810 or so employees given any good morning that you would call up there to find out how many employees I had. Uh, but I was always looking for good people that we could train to do the tough parts of the job. I was looking for kind of, uh, uh, you know, the, what you would generally look for in, in many. Uh, I was not looking for uh, a glamorous person necessarily. I was looking for things like honesty and integrity, 
uh, truthfulness, uh, all those kind of qualities that you would want for your neighbor or your brother or sister, uh, that you would want in any other role of life, and then you would teach them to do the tough parts of the job. And I think that in years past, many times they, we characterize that we're going to have uh, the tough guys and we're going to try to teach them the kind of the interaction with the community and so forth on a positive basis. Much, much more difficult to do that than, than the, uh, the way that I was uh, uh, thought that it ought to be. So I, I think that it's uh, the, the role of the media is to uh, is really they, they want to sell tickets to movies and uh, books at the bookstore and all the rest of that. And they don't do that by telling you many times the very boring or mundane parts of it. The number one thing in law enforcement that you do is you're an information gatherer. Uh, you go out and you're better. The better law enforcement people that you'll see throughout are, are pretty good with people. Uh, they communicate well and they take that information and they gather it up and they and their colleagues look it over to try to make uh, determinations, not only on one case, but in crime trends and the whole rest of it. Uh, so, you know, if you, you talk about, you know, the sliding car chases and the gun battles and all that, for every time that happens, 10 million times, uh, somebody writes a great report or does the interview to, to crack the case or does the survey in their uh, community about what's really bothering them as far as law enforcement and when what can we do to give that community a better uh, uh, you know quality of life and the rest of that so uh, you'll find that uh, if you get involved in law enforcement then you go to the movies and see what they how they characterize it uh, it's you know the guys are all not handsome the women are all not uh, glamorous and sexy uh, but you know I call them my brothers and sisters uh, because basically what you're trying to do out there is you're trying to be your brothers and sisters keeper. Uh, you know, there's a, you're the catcher in the rye. You're trying to keep people from going over the edge. You're trying to, uh, keep, uh, you're many times picking up the broken pieces of somebody else's quote unquote good time, especially in a college town. I can tell you that from uh, my own experience. So, uh, the whole, you're, you're seeing people as, uh, uh, Joseph Wambaugh said, uh, you're the new centurions. You see people at their weakest. Uh, you even help people when they don't want your help or they uh, do expressions of hate towards you, uh, and you, you take care of them anyway. It's a very, very high calling if you're into the, this profession uh, for the right reasons. Uh, you're asked to do some things. I can't believe when I first got into law enforcement in 1966 what I did for 100 bucks a week. Uh, but I did, and uh, it was the the career was wonderful to me, and so I'm part of coming back here is to try to pay back and and attract people who are like minded to come into this profession because it's all about the people that get involved in the profession, and you'll hear about uh, things that go wrong in law enforcement and in you know even to the extent of criminal type stuff. But if you look at the total profession, it's a very, very honorable profession. It, if I could add a little bit to that, um, <clears throat> I, I think what is fascinating, and I, I hope you're exposed to some of the research on this, because if anything, what we're seeing is it's no longer just television. Uh, it's, it's the uh, YouTube. It's all of the various ways in which we can reach people today. I have a a 14-year-old who is on Xbox, and uh, it, it is every bit as violent as anything you'd ever want to find, I think, in, on television. I wonder sometimes whether things are getting more violent or we've figured out different ways to deliver that content to, to people. But the one thing I'd like to say, uh, to echo a little bit of what the Senator says, you know, we, we spend so much time talking about the negative side of how this profession is exposed to uh, the worst in humanity, and we forget to talk about the, the joy of being exposed to the best in humanity. And that's what you see as well as a law enforcement officer. Uh, you don't spend your entire time chasing bad guys. Uh, you do have an opportunity to see people at their very, very best. And I wish we would talk more about that, particularly with those of you as you think about entering this profession. Because it literally is the boast, both. But you'll have a day, <laughs> a, an eight hour or 10 hour or 12 hour shift in which you will absolutely experience both the very best of humanity and the very worst of humanity. It's quite a swing. 
Um, how many of you watch Law and Order, just by a show of hands? Okay, and cold case files, maybe? Show of hands. I, I think there is a really a variable quality in in some of the television shows. I, I again, you know, Law and Order is is based upon something, some loose definition of fact. But it's probably, in in my humble estimation, one of the better uh, uh, drama shows that I've ever seen depicting uh, lo uh, law enforcement and prosecution. Uh, the cold case files, uh, I think, really goes to the senator's point about, you know, again, professional law enforcement that identify with victims of crime and will not give up on a case for 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 years, and then technology comes into play and they're able to do things that they weren't able to do 20 or 25 years ago. The, the value of, again, it's not shoot them up and it's not this and that, it's talking to people, it's just very careful investigation. So again, my, my point would be that there is you know, some of the popular television that's a lot better than, than some of the others. With regard to the media, I think that actually us, meaning professors like myself, we're not very good at it. Uh, you know, I can recall being called uh, by a reporter uh, on the Sharon Smith case where she had pushed her children into a lake and then was claiming that she had been, you know, uh, uh, their kids had been uh, kidnapped by an African American and so on and so forth. And then when the reporter called me, they had, she had actually uh, admitted that she was responsible and so on. And the question was, why did she do it? And uh, of course, I did the standard criminological thing. Well, we really don't know, do we? Uh, and we have some theories. And it's boom. <laughs> we have some theories and so on. But we don't know for certain what, what, what would propel someone to do this or that. I had the same thing with the Unabomber. Um, well, what's going on? I mean, some people say the Unabomber, they were doing profiles. Well, we really didn't have much in the way of research or case precedent to really come up with a very good profile of who the Unabomber happened to be. So again, I, I think that a lot of the media uh, does reflect some dramatization. They do want a storyline, but I think we have to share in, in the research and academic community some of the responsibility. We're not giving them the kind of information that sometimes they need in part because we don't have that information. You know, a, a reporter, the last thing they want to hear is, we don't know. I, I'll, I remember uh, there was in Alabama at a Taco Bell, someone had gone in and had murdered like six employees in the, in the cooler and I get this call and at some point I used the term, uh, I said, well, there are a variety of things. It could have been a former employee, it could have been just a rotten apple. It, I'm going through these things. Well, I get one of my former students, very high-ranking FBI agent, that, that uh, calls me the next day, Dr. Blomberg, with all your writing and research and publications, that was the best you could do? Or should I call you <laughs> Dr. Appleseed? Oh. Uh, so, you know, it, you know, again, we, we do bear some of the responsibility on some of these TV shows. We get calls. We get calls here in the College of Criminology. We want to develop this. What do you think about this, that, and so on and so forth? Uh, there is this effort. They want to depict reality, but they want to tell a story most of all, and they want to entertain. And that's where I think the rub comes in because entertainment uh, doesn't necessarily translate. I still can't understand why Law & Order was so popular for so long because it was really a kind of an unusual drama. So I do think there is a mixed bag. And I just wonder how many of you would be here in criminology if not for some of the media, if not for some of the television shows. Because the first thing I tell our freshmen when they come in is, we're not Miami CSI. We don't do that. You know? And some of them, oh, shoot, why am I here? Uh, so again, I, I do think there, there is a, a differential type of quality there. Well, I'll add to that about, you know, he's talking about Law and Order with the other movie that I used to, couldn't stand, it was uh, NYPD. And uh, during those, if you remember, that every suspect they even talked to, they slapped around. 
Uh, they would beat up their informants. They would, uh, you know, be very loosey goosey with the evidence and the, all the rest of it. The hated people on the show were the internal affairs people. That's where I'd put my best people in an internal affairs. But, uh, and then, you know, the trouble with that is you get a jury pool that's going to come in and hear a case. And the defense is going to be that you coerced the uh, confession out of them and you manipulated the evidence. And the jury pool saying, that's right, I saw it last night on TV, you know. So it sometimes has bigger ramifications than just watching it. You have to almost watch it like it's a, an animated cartoon involving Roadrunner and Coyote because that has a lot of times the same reality factor. Uh, you know, when when Coyote falls off a cliff, he would really die, you know. He wouldn't just uh, shake it off and go chasing the uh, Roadrunner once more. And that's the thing about law enforcement. You just see, you know, literally dozens of people be killed at any given night during between the chases and shootings and all the rest of that. And that's just not... Uh, real, realistic. So what you need to be in this kind of field is you need to be realistic about, uh, uh, you know, the, the, there are rules and there's a certain, uh, uh, you know, ramifications for the actions you take and you bear a huge responsibility uh, when you're in law enforcement, when you, you know, the power to carry a gun and a badge and have the power of arrest and take people's freedom away. That's a very, very heavy uh, responsibility and, and, uh, you know, you need to take it very seriously. Do you think law enforcement operations are under, underfunded, and if so, what impact does this have on an agency's ability to serve the community? Jim, I'm afraid to touch it. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, I'll start off. Um, I, it's a very interesting question. First, first and foremost, I don't know anybody who's overfunded um, anywhere in government or perhaps even in the private sector. It's a, it's a subjective uh, conversation, you know, how much, how much funding do you need and what do you need it for? I think the, the conversation generally needs to be about what are the services that a community wants from its mm -hmm. law enforcement agencies. Uh, recall that, that municipal police departments get their funding from city residents and county sheriffs get their funding from county residents and uh, that's where I think the majority of the conversations go. now. Uh, the senator and I both work for the Florida Department of Law Enforcement for a period of time, but I really think that question gets to the local level. And I guess I would say, uh, to kick it off, maybe try to stir a little controversy so the senator will jump in, but um, given the fact everybody's underfunded, I think we get in any community the level of service that, that citizens demand. Uh, if citizens demand additional services, uh, then the city elected officials or county elected officials will respond to that. Uh, here's, here's the truism in government. Uh, we all want to do more for people, or we wouldn't do these jobs. Uh, so I think you, you need to remember that every city agency and every county agency and every college and every university, we all want to do more. And, and so it's a tension between wanting to do more and having the funding to do more and, and how much is enough and how much is too much. Um, it, it's, it's not a simple answer to that question. Well, I'll, I'll um, elaborate a little bit on that as well as, as far as a personal, for, and I'm talking personally to you, is that if you're going to enter into this field, be it in law enforcement or corrections or juvenile uh, work or whatever, uh, I hope you don't have visions of making a lot of money. Uh, this is a service uh, business that you're here to serve, uh, uh, in your case, your respective communities, uh, and, and you're not going to make a lot of money unless you uh, uh, write a book or, uh, you know, something else or become a college professor. That's where you, oh, I didn't, I thought I, anyway, uh, uh, you're not going to make a lot of money being or, a, or a, a senator. Right? That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, most people don't know that a senator makes uh, upwards of $28,000 a year, so uh, <laughs> There's a, but uh, it, having said that, uh, this is not a high uh, uh, capital kind of uh, business. Uh, it's not even as high capital as firefighting. You don't have a lot of rolling stock. You know, you, you, 85% of my budget when I was a sheriff uh, went into the people that I hired. So I was, that was my number one priority is to uh, hire good people, take care of the people, try to give them as, as much uh, money as we possibly could afford. But uh, uh, Dr. Murdoch's right in that uh, the community is where that's about, and they put a value on it. Uh, they 
put a value on you know uh, on professional basketball players and they put it on uh, NFL players and they put it on school teachers and they put it on on uh, on law enforcement people cops and uh, the the rest is evident about what they put the value out there on but you cannot let that uh, stew about you then you're in the wrong line of work uh, if you expect that I'm going to be uh, financially secure th the rest of my life by being a cop it's just not going to happen. You're going to be, you'll be okay. Uh, you'll probably, uh, if you get married, you'll ha have both of you working, uh, your working life, uh, and you can have a, a good living, but it won't be a luxurious lifestyle by any means. But you'll get tremendous satisfaction that somebody who does make a lot of money, uh, that doesn't have that kind of a feeling of service and doesn't get gratified uh, by the sense of service that they do to their community. There's nothing that can take that away. It's very, very va valuable. What I would add to this uh, question would be the following. If uh, you're all criminology, most of you, I'm sure, are criminology students, so uh, what do you know about the cost of crime? I mean, how much do you uh, assume crime costs every 12 months? And let me give you a hint. We spend approximately $200 billion on crime control annually. 200 billion. I just saw that figure in a, a, a paper about 15 minutes ago. So 200 uh, billion is spent on crime. But what do you think it costs when you factor in victim costs? Getting back to is law enforcement funded enough? What do you think the cost of crime is? The best estimate. And and again, this every 12 months. Anybody want to take a guess? Well, how about a trillion dollars every 12 months? According to some of the best studies that have been done on victimization every 12 months, now keep in mind, a, a rape victim during one 12-month period goes on with costs maybe the rest of, of her life. Uh, so again, every 12 months, the, the best estimate, and, and again, this is by an economist by the name of, of Anderson who actually says it's way above a trillion. So if you ask me the question, is law enforcement uh, funded enough, when I start thinking about the cost of crime every 12 months, uh, it's a resounding no to me. We don't have enough law enforcement. We don't provide the kind of training and professional development opportunities that the senator mentioned are so integral to the, you know, really, quite frankly, one of the toughest jobs there is. You know, parenting may well be the toughest job, and teaching is another tough job, but boy, law enforcement, it's right up there. So again, I would argue, uh, again, that uh, as we begin to shake out our values and maybe move toward what Governor Scott has talked about, a business model, uh, well, a business model would be looking at costs of something that you want to reduce, and if you see the costs at that level, uh, there should be some correspondence with uh, what you're doing about it, and I don't think we're nearly there. In what shocked me some years ago, Florida correctional officers working in Florida prisons were paid under 20000 a year. 18003 I think, was what they began a salary. 18000 uh, working in Florida State Prison on death row. 18000 um, uh, It goes to Dr. Murdaugh's statement about what the, the, uh, the citizens want. Uh, I think citizens want protection. I think citizens want safety. Uh, you know, and uh, I'm not sure that uh, we probably have quite the political machinery and the ways in which we're able to allocate these resources in a way that really represents that. In your experience, how has the training of law enforcement officers progressed in order to meet the needs of a new brand of criminality? For example, that which is conducted in cyberspace. Is it difficult to find recruits with the necessary skills and or training necessary to investigate such crimes? Well, I'll take a stab at that one since I did training for a long time. Um, training has really made remarkable progress uh, within this business over the past decades. Uh, we've learned so much about how to properly train officers to perform under real world circumstances. And let me give you an example and, and again, some of us will relate to this, but in the old days, um, back in the days when we used revolvers when I started, or flintlocks, maybe it was flintlocks when I started. <laughs> we used to train an officer, they'd go out and they'd fire their weapon five times for a small 
uh, Smith and Wesson or six times if they had a if they had a larger revolver. But then we would open the cylinder, eject the empty cartridges. Does this sound familiar to you? Mm -hmm. Catch the empty cartridges in their hand, and sometimes they'd because we didn't want to have to pick them up later. We were being lazy, and we'd put those empty cartridges sometimes in our baseball cap, throw the baseball cap on our head. Well, over the years, what we learned was that what happens in training will actually be what an officer does under stress. And so there were some famous FBI studies that took a look at FBI agents who were involved in shootings. They went back and hypnotized those agents and, and to determine how they performed under stress in actual shootouts. And guess what they did? They opened the cylinder and caught the empty shells in their hand. Small example. We have, over the years, begun to make sure that we train under the circumstances, with the tools, and under the conditions that we're going to perform in the real world. To the extent that training is realistic, officer performance under stress is going to be realistic. Now, I will say, you know, you don't train your average recruit in cybercrime. <laughs> that is something that is a, a specialty that uh, people evolve into once they've been in the business for a while. But in terms of the quality of the training experience, I can personally tell you uh, over the past at least 30 years that I've been affiliated with it, it has made remarkable strides forward in terms of what we are turning out today. And I remember when I started, it was 200 hours of training. Uh, it's now 836 hours of training with field training officer experience that follows on with all of that. Uh, based upon a job task analysis, it's all very scientific the way it's put together today. Great strides in training. We're producing people that I just shake my head and think, you have no idea how lucky you are <laughs> to get the kind of training that you're getting before you leave this academy experience. But cybercrime, which was specifically mentioned, we do that training, but it's reserved for officers who have experience, and they come back for that as, as in-service or continuing education or advanced training once they're on, on the job. We, uh, as you know, many of you, we have a computer criminology major now at Florida State in response to this very thing about cybercrime, but also terrorism and a very, various other sorts of things. So here at Florida State, we're trying to respond to the changing nature of crime and the need for greater specialization. Uh, additionally, uh, uh, in the spring, we'll begin a forensic accounting program, uh, a partnership with the College of Business and the Department of Accounting. And uh, again, I think we're getting great response by the federal law enforcement agencies that for the for, uh, forensic accounting as well as the computer criminology. Uh, I, would, I would say that I know when I was an undergraduate student at Berkeley and studied with Jerome Skolnick, who uh, wrote a very famous book called Justice Without Trial, he made the argument that in the future he expected that the law enforcement organizations would begin to transform sometime in the future away from more the paramilitary model toward a more traditional model with lateral entry instead of all vertical. Uh, I do think there is going to be greater specialization uh, in the future, and I think computer criminology, forensic accounting, the way the world is changing, the way law enforcement uh, is changing, the way crime is changing, it's, it's absolutely essential. And I think we're kind of uh, leading the pack in, in moving our program and providing all of you with the kind of options that will make you what we hope uh, very good law enforcement uh, uh, justice agency employees. Strong verbal and written communication skills are clearly necessary for interactions with the community, other officers, and other agencies. How important are such skills for those seeking employment in the field and for promotion to higher positions? Oh, I'll take a communication uh, is, as I said earlier, is the number one thing that you're going to be doing. You think about it, you get a call if you're, as we used to say, pushing a green and white or a uniform. Uh, a call or if you're a you know detective or whether you're a, a federal agent uh, basically when you go out to uh, the scene of something uh, or, or to interview people you're on a fact-gathering mission how well you uh, interact with those folks both uh, verbally and non-verbally uh, is going to be crucial to the success of not only uh, the case but probably your career uh, here again, the, the media gets involved in this. The rough, gruff, slap you around guy uh, gets the job done is, is uh, the vast exception, not the rule. The rule is that people that have 
pretty good people skills are generally turn out to be your best cops and their best investigators. So I can't stress to you enough uh, when we talk about professionalization, about uh, how you interact with people, practice, uh, take speech, take uh, communication, uh, take English composition, uh, take uh, courses in your writing ability where you get up on the stand and you're not embarrassed to read your own notes. All those kind of things that makes you a better communicator, uh, both in-house, meaning in the agency that you work for, uh, be it big or small, and as importantly, or maybe more importantly, your ability to communicate with people in your community. And now we live in a very uh, diverse uh, communities uh, throughout, uh, certainly the state of Florida. So your ability to uh, compete, uh, or I shouldn't say that, not compete, but to communicate uh, with various kinds of people because you will go on one call and it'll be some sort of a thing that involves very educated, perhaps wealthy, well-spoken people, and the next call you get might be the exact opposite, people that are not very skilled in their communication skills, uh, perhaps are illiterate, and, uh, but their concerns and their uh, uh, sense of uh, justice is no less than the people who have uh, lots of money and lots of uh, skills at their um, at behalf. And w one of the things that you need to remember here again to go back to that thing is that you're, uh, you're sworn to be somebody's, uh, the, some, a brother or sister uh, keeper out there on the street. And you uh, pledge to take care of them, whether they're rich or poor, uh, black, white, whatever they, their uh, uh, background is, uh, you promise to take care of them and do all those kind of things that I've talked about before, protect the, uh, uh, the, the uh, less, the, the weaker from the stronger and more oppressive. Uh, you are many times a peacemaker. Uh, the whole job is uh, far more than making arrests and booking people and all the rest of that. It's a lot of times it's uh, helping people in their own communities uh, communicate better with their neighbors and their family members and the rest of it. This is a very, very tall order. Uh, we have, like I go back to the, what the dean said about uh, we, we, we have just, we, I think that we're still st stuck in a model that's, uh, you know, uh, has been the paramilitary, which I don't have any problem with, except that even the military, you many times you enter as a an officer uh, as opposed to entering as an enlisted man. It doesn't take away from the importance of both, but uh, many times if you uh, got an education uh, and and you wanted to have this field, you had the fire in your belly to be a uh, cop, uh, and you put the education forward, I have no problem with paying you more than I would to somebody that has the training and is a high school graduate. And I hope that that's the direction that we're headed. One of the things I uh, might be a little odd to add to the conversation, but communication is incredibly important, uh, the skills, both oral and written skills. You know, sometimes people get confused about when we talk about the written skills, but the written skills are really more about being able to communicate in writing what you observed. I mean, and it's not about being able to write eloquently. Um, it's about being clear and being factual about the things that you observe. But one of the other things about communication, some of you who are, who are interested in going into law enforcement, need to understand communication is one of the tools in your toolkit. No different than your weapon, no different than an impact weapon. Uh, you can choose to use that tool in a way that either escalates or de-escalates the situation. And I've done both, uh, frankly. There have been times when I wanted somebody to take a swing at me, and I can guarantee you I can make that happen in a communication. There have been more times, thankfully, when I wanted to make sure that it re we reached a peaceful end. And you can actually refine and practice and get good at the use of verbal communication as a tool, hopefully to arrive at peaceful ends more often than not. But it is one of the most important things you can practice and get better at in this business. And just to add, and, uh, communication is, is just so essential in, in whatever career track that all of you follow. But again, the idea, one of the problems with higher education today, and, and maybe the senator's going to remedy this problem in the next session, but one, one of the problems is, I believe, having been here and taught uh, for over 38 years now, is that we don't give you enough opportunities to develop and hone your writing skills. 
uh, uh, and, and writing has a lot to do with your verbal abilities as well, but to, to be able to get these ideas down, and then to, the, also the commitment to work at your writing, to realize that it doesn't spring from the brow of genius. This is something you really work at. You develop analytical skills, you, you get systematic, you've got a problem, you've got a solution. It, again, thinking about that. So again, I think the message that all of you need to take very seriously, put yourself in a situation with uh, directed individual studies or classes where you get writing experience. Uh, you cannot get enough, whether you're going to law school, law enforcement, some other career track. Uh, you're gonna write, and you're gonna write, and you're gonna write and uh, you, you never get to be too good of a writer. One other little recommendation, read the New Yorker magazine, read good writing. Good writing helps us become better writers. And the New Yorker magazine constantly has criminological relevant pieces in there. Uh, and I think you'll, you'll see how, how it's done. So again, really practice writing. Many law enforcement agencies are moving away from the traditional reactive model of policing and toward community and intelligence-based problem-solving models. Does such a move in policing styles require a non-traditional skill set? I don't think it's a non-traditional skill set at all. I mean, I, I go back to watching uh, Andy Griffith uh, and Barney Miller. I mean, I'll show my age. Um, I think it is, it, it has always been uh, at the core of effective policing is understanding we are brothers and sisters. We are a community. Uh, we are not apart from the community. We are a part of the community. And I think it's at the core of, of effective policing, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll add to that uh, as well. It's, it's about uh, feeling like you are a, a community. I had a uh, requirement that, that my deputy sheriffs, those people that were had a badge, had a gun, that they lived inside the county. And that's, uh, you'll think about it, it's, uh, it's in a lot of places very rare that the police officers, like in Los Angeles, uh, something like 20% of them live in Los Angeles. So they get not only a, a, a thing, uh, one of the uh, occupational hazards in law enforcement is a them and us. Uh, we are us, meaning law enforcement people, and the people are them. And uh, it's a, there's a divide there. You're not one of us, so you must be one of them. And uh, they have a lot of defense mechanisms, meaning I'm rough, gruff, and don't even approach me uh, kind of things. Uh, another occupational hazard is suicides. Some, you know, it's been between two and three times the general population for as long as I can remember. Uh, it, you know, alcoholism. Uh, divorce rate is way, way higher than, than the uh, national average for for the general population. <coughs> Lots of uh, stress that is internalized. It's not externalized, it's internalized, and there's a price to be paid for that. And uh, my deal was that I wanted the people in my community, uh, if you wanted to be the law enforcement per, uh, person that was out in that community, you need to pay your taxes there. You need to have the, your uh, neighbors uh, be the neighbors that you police. You need to have your kids go to the same schools that uh, the people that you police uh, go to. You need to uh, be an active member. I try to get them to uh, uh, be uh, little league coaches, uh, be an assistant at the library, uh, whatever it might be, uh, be in the PTA, uh, belong to some organizations where you are not surrounded by cops. Uh, because, uh, you know, many times there's a, there's a feeling that we need to protect ourselves uh, psychologically as much as anything else from the intrusion of people that don't know, and it goes back to that kind of TV mentality about, uh, you know, uh, what we're all about, and uh, the, there's a lot of kind of uh, uh, false uh, br bravado and uh, sense of brotherhood when that should be much more community oriented and uh, the good police officers and good police agencies are very, very involved in their communities. I, having said that, I am not a big advocate of community oriented policing just from a staffing and many times there are people that, uh, that major in criminology that are much more able to go out and work with youth uh, and, and community activities than perhaps a police officer can. And it's, very, it's all about resources, and we have enough trouble answering calls for service that we have. 
uh, and I'm not at all opposed to uh, uh, partnering with those folks to make a better all a better um, uh, lifestyle uh, uh, for the people that you police because that's what it's all about it's about you know, I don't care uh, where you are if you're afraid to go outside your house or afraid to go have the kids play in the yard because of the neighborhood if it's uh, got drug sales and prostitution and all the rest of it uh, you wonder uh, you can be just as incarcerated as people that uh, are locked up in the local jail or in a prison. Uh, you may become the, a prisoner in your own home, and uh, what law enforcement can do is release uh, some of that to where you have a sense of freedom and stability to go about your life, to go to school and to go to work and to go to you know a church and your recreational activities with not having that sense of fear. Tremendous numbers and percentages of, of uh, people in communities uh, live with a certain sense of fear uh, that is either not called for or is unnecessary because uh, law enforcement and the social agencies are not doing a good enough job to help them out. Just, uh, you might find this interesting, uh, in 1817, uh, Sir Robert Peel actually wrote up the design for the London Metropolitan Police. And in that design, he stipulated that uh, the London police uh, would be, must be residents of the areas that they policed. And the concern there was with this whole idea of avoiding the community residents' perception of an army of occupation. And, and US police, uh, uh, many would say, uh, 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 police designs were modeled after the London Metropolitan Police. I have a test here for the criminology students. So what did they call those police officers? Huh? Sir Robert Peel's police officers. What did they call them? Bobbies. Come on. She, where are we? She, no, did she have yeah. it right? Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> good. For those who may be interested in becoming a sheriff one day or a police officer, could you guys please explain what the typical career path or career ladder looks like in your field? I can, I can take it, take I guess. Sure. <laughs> well, uh, I did the, uh, the, the kind of the, the traditional way. I uh, got my two-year degree and was a police officer while I got my degree. Uh, worked uh, evening shifts and, and went to school uh, during the day and caught naps in the shower. And, um, you know, it was uh, very tough working 40, 45 hours a week. Uh, but I got that degree and then I came to Florida State University because I wanted to further uh, my education and, and uh, plan for the future, uh, that I wanted to uh, be one day a, a, a leader in this uh, thing that they call law enforcement or, or uh, uh, police work or, or uh, being a cop and all the rest of that. Uh, it, it Traditionally, you start off right now in the state of Florida, you have to be 18 years old and, and have a high school diploma and have to go, as we talked about this, eight, I think it's 840 hours or something like that, hours um, hours. training. When I first started, uh, there they had just implemented 200 hours of training. Uh, I happened to be at a very, at that time, progressive place, St. Petersburg Police, and they required uh, 480, I think it was, 10 weeks anyway, or 12 weeks. And uh, you went out on the street uh, with a senior um, officer, and they moved you around. You worked uh, primarily in uniform patrol. Uh, by the way, uniform patrol was always my favorite. I will confess to that. I confessed to it when I was a, a sheriff. Uh, those are the people that interact with your public on a daily basis. It can be, uh, it's mostly positive. And people always used to say to me, they said, Sheriff, I wouldn't have your job for anything. All the complaints and so forth. And I did get complaints every once in a while, but for every complaint, I've got to tell you, I had 12 or 14 uh, positive interaction with uh, my deputy sheriffs and the public out there. Even sometimes, uh, you know, I, the uh, sheriff's deputy stopped me last night and, uh, you know, gave me a ticket, which I don't deserve, of course. And, uh, but I can't tell you how professionally he or she was and how they conducted themselves and how uh, they were professional in their appearance and how they, care, you know, uh, told it. So I just wanted to relate that to you. Uh, those are the best. And what I would tell people is to make sure you get out a piece of notebook paper if necessary and write that down so it can go in those people's file. 
Uh, I used to say the best thing about being a sheriff uh, was that I got to work with heroes every day. And, and a lot of times those were big, exciting kinds of things of pulling people out of a burning car or whatever, but a lot of times it wasn't anything unusual at all. It was about helping people out with a particular problem that they had. Uh, we would have policies that you don't drive by somebody broken down on the side of the road. You just don't do that. Uh, you stop and at least help them. Even if you're on a call, you tell them, I'm going to try to get you some help out here. Uh, you would uh, interact with each and everybody. If people called you, you would call them back. If people wrote you, you would write them back. Uh, if they emailed you, you would email them back. As long as I was the sheriff, you never had anybody answer the phone with, a, with a, one of these menus. A person answered the phone. You were never allowed to ask who's calling. You were never allowed to ask what's this in reference to. That was including me. And so I'd get calls about, uh, you know, uh, they'd go to the switchboard, switchboard, send them, and they'd say, Sheriff, you have a call on line one. And I'd say, this is Steve Ulrich. Can I help you? And they would say, I want to talk to the sheriff. And I said, I am the sheriff. And they would say, don't BS me. I want to talk to the head guy. You know, that was in today. And you know, the reason I sold this to my people was you have a problem with a bank. You have a problem with a phone company. You have a, how many times do you get the runaround? And, and just a, a, see, a feeling of futility when it goes from menu number one to menu number two to menu number three. And uh, I said, we're just not going to have that. And people were amazed at that. And I still get, I'm more amazed at business. The business people are trying to sell you something. And if they sell you something, they make a little bit about off of that, a commission or a, a profit margin. And still, you have your money in your hand and you want to purchase their product or service. And it is so difficult for you to to get through that maze of doing that or if you had some sort of problem to get through that whole thing what are these people thinking of i mean it's just amazing and they would tell me that this allows more uh, flexibility and all the kind of stuff and what it does it puts you and the service people that you're trying to serve and makes a a a chasm there a spance between you and trying to insulate your people from the service that you render. And I think that's a complete and utter mistake, be, whether you're going into business or going into law enforcement or whatever j job you're going into. So I would want to, to urge each of you to keep very close. Uh, and are you gonna get uh, troublesome calls and quirky calls and all the rest of it, have to deal with strange people and all the rest of that? Absolutely. And these deputies would come up to me and say, Sheriff, this would be a great job. If I didn't have to work with people's problems all day, well, you better need to know up front that what you're going to do for a living is, is try to clean up the mess in somebody else's life. You're going to try to, um, uh, you're going to have, you're going to be dealing with their problems. And that leads to these law enforcement problems that I'm talking about with the law enforcement people. This feeling of frustration, this feeling of uh, depression, uh, the whole alcoholism thing. Uh, some deal with this in very destructive ways uh, to include suicide because you're going to be on a diet of helping other people and a lot of times, most of the time, it's not very pretty. And so you just need to get used to that. But you also have to do that you are doing extremely important work. You are the, 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 the vanguard between chaos and ha giving somebody a sense of order. Uh, and, and it's a very, very high calling, and you need to go every day of your life remembering that and reminding yourself that I'm in a high calling. I'd like to talk a little bit about the, the idea of uh, planning your career. I mean, it sounded like that was really a part of, of this question, and, and I get asked the question a lot, and you know, I ran the academy for 11 years. I would always get this question from people in the academy, and, and I must tell you that my experience is that no matter what you think you may want to do today, um, there's no way for you to map out a career today if you're entering this business for where you want to be. And I would, I would suggest to you our conversation earlier about cybercrime. Ten years ago, it didn't exist. Uh, when I began in this business, there was no computer crime. And for you... There was you, no computer. There were no computers, that's right. <laughs> the, uh, uh, and we wrote with chisels. If yeah. You know I mean. yeah. <laughs> Tough to write a report back then. The, uh, so think about your career. I, I like to advise you to think about your career and your, your personal development in three ways. I kind of refer to it as a three-legged stool. 
your education, which you're working on now, and I hope you would continue. Uh, training, once you get out of here, seek training opportunities every chance you get to continue to grow and expand and learn new things, and then experience. And I think if you can round those three things out and continue to grow those things, then when an opportunity arises that's right for you, you're going to know it, and you're going to pick that opportunity, and you're going you're to do those things. But, uh, you know, I think it has never been more evident than it is today that, that the future specialties in law enforcement, the things that will be specialties five and ten years from now, we don't even know about today. And one thing I would add in, in the many, many years I've been here and the thousands of students that I've had the pleasure of chatting with, talking with, advising, and so on, uh, and then them coming back and telling me about different things in their life that you know was very monumental in their career and, and so on. The, the need to be really always challenging yourself. Uh, don't accept the average. You know, don't be satisfied just with the average. You know, we, we really hope you know, that we're turning out critical thinkers, people that are gonna make a difference in this world. The world needs thinkers. The world needs innova innovators. Uh, you do need to sort of, I, I think uh, uh, Dr. Murdaugh's suggestions are, are excellent, as are the senators. I would just add, challenge yourself, push yourself to the maximum. Uh, there's so much out there. You know the wonderful thing about criminology, I've been at it forever. And I'm more excited now than I was when I began because I see so many more new things that are coming up. Unfortunately, I don't have time to follow all of them. You know, I'm getting... Uh, up there. Uh, I just turned 40. Yeah, uh, right. So, uh, A lot of but, <laughs> but yeah. again, I think really challenging yourself, really pushing yourself, because whatever career choice you make, law enforcement, criminal justice, law school, I won't even go into it. Don't go to law school. Please don't go to law school. We don't need more lawyers, and you'll probably, many of you will go to law school. Uh, my son did, and I, I spent 18 years trying to tell him not to. Uh, but whatever career choice you make is to, the, really this idea of pushing yourself. I think you're in a challenging educational program. You're among the best of the best. We've got incredible students here. So you're experiencing a lot of challenge and so on in your educational process. But don't let it stop when you graduate. Just really get it, get it rolling and keep pushing. Yeah. One, one thing I would add to what uh, Tom just said is that uh, one of the things, if you do this right, uh, when you start out in this career, you ought to be 100% practitioner. And through the years, you're going to make a transition from being a 100% uh, practitioner to a 100% mentor. You're going to get your satisfaction and your uh, feeling of uh, accomplishment by others doing the things right rather than you doing the things right. At first, you want to do the things right as best you can, and I would also encourage you to try to get as many mentors as you possibly can, people that you say, I don't know what that man or woman has, but I want some of it. I want in, the, in this professional field or in the personal field, for that matter, and uh, to follow that because uh, what this thing is, you know, we talk about art and science, and, and I, I think that law enforcement is probably – 80% art and 20% science, but uh, there's the scientific part of it, but it's, it's about the human element, and you need to develop that, and uh, you get a career in this, a successful career, um, you're going to be a, a really good person. This now concludes our questions from us, and we'd like to open up the floor to, uh, to questions from the audience. If you could raise your hand, Eric and I will come around with a wireless mic so we can pick you guys up. And if you don't raise your hands, I know all your names. Mm -hmm. I'll call on you. Greg, I'll begin with you. I know you have a question. <laughs> Put him on the spot. Yeah. Well, Dean, you, yeah, you got to turn it on. Hello. And at FSU, they call that low bid. That's a little bit motor. Uh, you know. That's the, what yeah. the legislature does. Yeah, yes. that's right. <laughs> he's, he's just trying to get more Pico dollars. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> well, 
Uh, first and foremost, definitely put me on the spot. Uh, <laughs> so I needed a few minutes to kind of gather my thoughts. But uh, um, you, you kind of, kind of, one thing I want to look back on, and maybe any any of you could really clarify, uh, is more and speak more in detail of mentors. You know, uh, I think it's crucial. There's a lot of students I spent some time with while I've gone back to school. How can you, for students that are here, what do you recommend? Where to find them? Uh, certain fields, uh, certain uh, uh, type of businesses, uh, titles, where would you recommend a lot of the students to start looking and assimilate? Well, I, I would t tell you to find them in all the right places, uh, and that would not include uh, uh, bars and, and uh, you know, uh, disco or whatever you want to call it, uh, dance clubs. It's, uh, that's, that's a, you may very well go there and have a great time, but that's probably not where you go to uh, uh, find your mentors. To find your mentors is probably you, they're going to example themselves in front of you in so many ways. Uh, and, and so it would not, uh, you, you would also, as, dis as discriminating as this, uh, fo these folks are in this room, you're going to know the, the kind of the people that you want to follow or d not follow after some exposure to them. And if that's not the right one, then go find another. Uh, but a lot of this uh, uh, business, I'd say, is that, that chasm between them and us, and, and you need to take the initiative to go seek uh, the us, meaning the law enforcement people. And you can do that through, uh, uh, you know, the, I'm sure that both the sheriff's office here and the police department probably have very developed uh, uh, programs to ride along. Uh, we had a very active ride along. A program where you go out with a deputy sheriff and ride and answer calls and all the rest of that. That's an excellent uh, uh, form to get in to know the person that's sitting to the right. And you'll see uh, things done very well generally. And some of them you'll see that are that would not be your style at all, uh, or or things that you might think are just flat wrong. Uh, but it's good exposure. You you kind of uh, develop. Uh, the, the knowing uh, your craft and developing your craft. One more thing, if, we, if this gets to be a time, I'm going to encourage everybody here to uh, try to go to local law enforcement, not some federal agency that you think would be really glamorous, uh, but you're not going to have a, a very much contact with the, the stuff that you're going to learn here about being involved in communities and answering calls for people and all the rest of that. You just get separated from that and and uh, you're you're not on a hands-on basis uh, there's a lot of federal agencies that do not have big time workloads and one of the things that local law enforcement will give you is a lot of work to do and a, a chance to uh, uh, use your craft on literally an hourly basis uh, that you the skills that you're going to learn here and, and sometimes it's a great question sometimes the mentors pick you mm -hmm. Um, I will tell you, my first experience, I was brand new rookie and was at a meeting of back then a group called the Governor's Police Task Force. It was chaired by a gentleman by the name of Dale Carson. Dale Carson was a sheriff of Jacksonville. He was a legend. And he happened to ask me a question. Um, and I basically politely said, well, Sheriff, I I'm brand new. And quite frankly, you know, I don't really have anything to add. And he didn't say anything. Um, next time I saw him, he pulled me off to the side. He says, son, I asked you a question the last time we were here. And uh, when I ask you a question in the future, I want you to answer the question. He says, here's what I want you to remember. There's some people that have 10 years of experience. And there's some people that have one year of experience 10 times. So when I ask you a question, I want you to answer it. And he took me under his wing. And from, from then on, every time we were at a meeting, he was kind to me and pulled me off to the side and talked to me a little bit. And so you'll find it's just like any other relationship in, in many ways. You know, it starts sometimes in an odd way. But I will tell you, that man had a tremendous impact on me in, in my formative mm -hmm. years. The thing I would add, uh, one of the things that we teach our graduate stu uh, students that are going to go out and do research and and particularly if they're going to be doing something beyond just working with data sets, but also interviewing criminal justice personnel, for example, that one of the ways that you are able to conduct an effective interview is that you get the interviewee to take the role of teacher, and you become the student. And once that ro those roles are understood, 
uh, you would it sometimes gets the thing how do I cut this situation off because a lot of teaching is going on and so on and so forth now I use that analogy because I think that with mentoring you know you've got to seek the person out you've got to be the squeaky wheel uh, sometimes yes I know as professors we will have students that you know really just somehow there's a connection whatever it is it might be after class it might be the student comes in they express interest and you do then begin to work with that student but typically in all my long experience it's been the student that comes to to you and opens up that I'm interested in this I want to do this sometimes they're very blunt about but I I'm, I'm really I'm not good at this and I'm not good at that and so on and so I think uh, open what we talked about earlier open and honest communication and not being afraid you know but to go to go forward and and talk to people as well as all of you talking to one another one of the things that I like about Florida State I believe that among the undergraduate and graduate students there's more cooperation and and care among students at Berkeley I can tell you that the first day of freshman orientation, they said, look at the faces in front, look at the faces in back, look right, look left, 70% will be gone in one year, they will flunk out. Uh, that was, what an <laughs> awful way to start. A, and you know, I can, well, I'm not gonna flunk out. Oh, poor people, I should start waving by now. I, you know, it's just awful. And I, I, don't, I think that there is much more of a friendly environment. I know my first day on campus, many, many years ago, I walked across campus and someone said hello, and I thought, what a weird person. I don't even know them, you know. So, so again, I, I think open, you know, seeking people out, taking the initiative, being proactive is helpful. Thank you. Um, my question has to deal with uh, those of us looking to go into government agencies, although you said try not to. Um, in terms of internships in the Tallahassee area, where would you guys suggest maybe looking uh, for those opportunities? Well, the big three would be the, the uh, Tallahassee Police Department, the uh, Leon County Sheriff's Office, and, and uh, the Florida Department of Law Enforcement and other uh, state agencies uh, and, and make inquiries there. It really doesn't, my uh, attitude about internships was that it doesn't really cost the agency anything, gives you another, and, and you'll bring something to the table. You may not realize that now, but just like uh, the president said, you know, you, you try to get, you you all mingle together to just get a certain culture that you're looking for. And if you're a person from a university and, some, and so forth and you're, you have a background, you're gonna bring something to the table. You may not realize it now, but it, it, you, you will. And so it's a, I always welcomed interns. Uh, I hope other agencies do uh, welcome interns now because quite frankly, it gives you another little piece of uh, work uh, uh, to help out in the task of, of, of your mission. And, and I, I would strongly encourage you to do internships for a couple of reasons. Mm -hmm. One is to figure out where you, the culture in which you want to work. I started with a sheriff's office here in Leon County, moved to Fort Walton Beach, and then later worked with the state. The culture of a police department is very different than the culture of a sheriff's department, which is very different than the culture of a state agency. And we're all suited for for something different. I went from a huge county to a city where, where I felt like I was driving around in circles because it was so small. And for me, it was very confining. Uh, it's an opportunity for you to figure out where the fit is for you. And frankly, it's an opportunity for them to kind of do, assess you as well. If you're interested in working with that agency, uh, it's kind of like a job preview where they can kind of check you out and go, that's somebody we want on our team. I've been uh, debating whether or not to go into FDLE or just general police work like a police department or sheriff's office. From your experiences, what are some of the positives and negatives of FDLE and positives and negatives of just a sheriff's department? Well, having done both, uh, I've worked as a city police officer, as a, uh, a county uh, a sheriff, and also as a uh, special agent for the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. I think that you would I would recommend absolutely that you go someplace locally, even if it's for, for two or three years, to kind of get your basics on the, uh, and it'll absolutely hone 
your communication skills and your uh, ability to face different kinds of situations as a first responder. Uh, it's, it's an opportunity to, for you to test yourself and to uh, do a lot of good things, including uh, helping save lives and all the rest of that when you're out there and have to think on your feet uh, in a, uh, emergency situations and handle a variety of different things that you would never get at uh, the Florida Department of Law Enforcement on a routine basis. Uh, because those are what we call latent investigations. In other words, the thing has already happened. You're handed something to been assigned to a case, and you kind of start off working. Uh, as a first responder, you get to the scenes of uh, various things. One thing about it, it's much more exciting, you know, quite frankly. And, and part of what I used to sell, I used to sell the steak, but also I sold the sizzle. I said, you want to work in a, in a job where, where other people watch on TV, on the news, or read about in the newspaper, you were there. You knew exactly what went down, and, and you know, this, that, or the other happened at that. I, I think that just adds to your repertoire of how you, not only as a, as a law enforcement professional, but as a person. I mean, uh, military is the same way. You get in situations that, uh, that test your mettle, so to speak, and uh, make you a, um, a more rounded person. And the, the other part about it is not just the uh, first responder kind of a thing. You're just going to go see, like I said, rich, poor, black, white, uh, uh, Asian, whatever it might be, a whole vast, vast variety of people that you might not encounter in any other situation. And it, it can't help uh, but make you a, a better professional long term. I have to chime in and agree. Um, it is the range of experience you get when you're out there in a uniform responding to a call. Uh, that is so much more rich than what you're going to get at FDLE. What they do is extremely important. You know, people seem to have this allure to want to get to plain clothes as quickly as possible. Um, but I would tell you, I, I, I echo that. The best time I ever had was in uniform patrol. But you'll, you'll, the range of experience allows you to hone your skills. It allows you to, to polish your communication skills. It allows you to develop your rapid cognition, allows you to figure out your instincts, and those things serve you well the rest of your career. You don't get that range when you're working in an, uh, an investigative organization. You still no. get it. Well, also, too, it's part of this is the whole media kind of a thing, and we talk about entertainment and so forth. You don't see a uniform police uh, organizations or individuals um, uh, being... Uh, acted out and glamorized very much. It's always the investigator, the detective, and they do all. Well, you know, the uh, the dean talked about uh, CSI in Miami and the guy that, you know, you just, that is so far from the truth, whether you go from picking up the hair on the, you know, uh, sidewalk or whatever to going out to making the arrest. It just does not happen. You, you're going to get a much better uh, rendition and a feel for the whole field that you're in in a, in a local agency. And then if that's your choice to go to, you know, state and federal or the rest of that, um, that's, a, that's a choice you can make at that time. And I, I think as, as young professionals getting started, uh, to get that experience, for example, in a, a police department, a sheriff's department, it's, it's going to give you an array of experiences that may well help you focus in on a particular area. Let's just say, for example, victim services. This is where my heart lies. Uh, we have a lot of our graduate students that were law enforcement officers that felt, well, I really want to get involved more in the training and education of other prospective law enforcement, so I'm going to go back and get a master's and PhD. So that you're, you're, you're on a career trajectory, and I think starting and getting that absolute important experience uh, is, is crucial, and it will inform you to make better decisions on your career trajectory. Or youth work, you know, get involved yeah. in youth work. But you'll get exposed to that from the uniform patrol aspect. And I just want to say thanks for asking that question, because, yeah. you know, that's on a lot of people's mind. Mm -hmm. We're all in a hurry to kind of get to, that, to, the, to the goal but enjoy every single step of the way. Focus on that. Focus on enjoying your time in patrol and really making the most out of it before you get there. Enjoy your education here, first of all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, I understand you guys all worked here in Florida, but I have a question regarding going out of state. Um, here you can use the internship credit for 15 hours of school credit. You can take an internship, and you can do the actually the police academy at Pat Thomas. Um, I'm wondering how that carries on to somebody who's going to move out of state, if they should not do that and then take an out of state police academy, or if taking Pat Thomas and then moving out of state and trying to get a job then is a better idea. Because I know for 100% fact, I will not be staying in Florida after I graduate, but I do want to be a police officer. Well, I don't know what we did to you. Um. <laughs> uh, it's you my girlfriend's fault. What did you so. do to him, Tom? Uh, it's Bill Bales. Uh, okay. Um, that's a great question, and I could. I can answer the question if you wanted to come to Florida. I really can't answer it if you want to move out of Florida because every state does it differently. Uh, so I would say this, you're, you're smart to be concerned about it. Do the research. If you know what state you want to move to, find that column. They, every state has a, uh, what we call a post. It's not called that in Florida, but it's generally uh, the term is post, police officer standards and training, uh, council of some kind. And you can find that information out. But please do before you invest any time in anything. But I, I would just, again, I would speculate, and it's speculation, and, and Dr. Murdaugh is absolutely correct, do your research. But again, my guess is it's going to make you uh, a more uh, kind of desired prospect for that organization given the degree that you have from Florida State and the fact that you've done this internship and you have specific law enforcement training. You may well have to go through their training to get certified, but boy, as far as getting ultimately hired, I think that's going to be a big plus. That would be, if I was looking at the applicants, I would see that as a plus. Yeah, it doesn't hurt you. Uh, we have graduates from our academy that go to work for the federal government as FBI agents, Secret Service agents, and so forth. And it is considered a plus, but I think your question's a good one. I think you should yeah. research it. This is the question I kind of wanted to ask, but uh, in, in looking at that, if you had to kind of reflect back of your career paths and you've kind of assessed it all, is there is there that, that gold nugget or is there something, I wished I had done that, I wish I'd got that additional training, I wished I had been involved in student government, whatever, is there something you look back on that would have really rounded me out and I wished I'd done that? Well, I, I can say that I wish I was more active and what's uh, offered here at Florida State. Even back in the 60s, it was offered. I just didn't take uh, as much advantage. I didn't have a very close relationship with any of the, my professors. It was a go to school, get out of class. Uh, nobody drew you in, but I didn't uh, to make the effort to draw in. This is a, uh, any, uh, this opportunity that you have here, same way at the University of Florida and other, you know, Central Florida, all the different uh, clubs and organizations and so forth that are here. I don't care if you're interested in, you know, the Spanish language or or the photo uh, club or whatever. There's no doubt in the it's, uh, size of campus, this place, that there's got to be every single interest. And I would have I would have uh, dived in more uh, into the whole uh, thing that was offered. Uh, I'd been a cop. I wanted to get through this, you know, and then get out. And I would have uh, smelled the roses a lot more. Uh, and had a much better relationship with my uh, professors if I had a uh, really stop and said I need to think about where I want to be you know 10 years from now and 20 years from now not where I want to be at the end of this semester you know that sort of thing yeah, I uh, it's an interesting question I I have no regrets I've had the wonderful opportunity to be everything from officer friendly to commander of the tactical team the one thing that's interesting when you ask that question that I wish I had done, not for career purposes, but because I think it would have been rewarding, I wish I'd have been a canine officer. I, uh, I look at those officers and I think, you know, how much fun would that have been? Mm -hmm. But I wouldn't change, again, I don't, think it, uh, I don't think it's a matter of picking the right things that you do. I think it's being prepared for the opportunities, like I mentioned, and then taking advantage of those opportunities as they present themselves. I, what I would add in my career, I. I I'm pleased, happy. It's been a wonderful career. I think it's an honor uh, to do what we do, you know, in higher education, and that is to work with, with all of you. It, it is a wonderful honor, and it's also a challenge. But I think the one thing that 
uh, hits me now is where we stand in our discipline of criminology. We want to have more of a public policy role, but you know we're not very well equipped to do it. We don't fully understand the, the, what the senator lives each day. We don't understand the political process, and we're not very good at it. And I had these ideas uh, throughout most of my, my past 40-year career Ah, politics, eh, kind of that, you know, I, I know what it is. I, I sort of thought I knew it was kind of behind the scenes, back slapping, deals being made, and things that I didn't like very well and didn't really want to be a part of it. Well, uh, I didn't recognize my ignorance. And uh, I have come to recognize my ignorance, and in doing so, uh, you know, I'm a novice. I'm just beginning to learn that it's so complicated, and yet I see it so integral to our role as criminologists, if our science is going to have something to do with reducing the misery and suffering of crime, we got to get into that political process. We've got to work with the politicians. We can't just throw names and just blow them off. Uh, and so that's an area. Fortunately, my wife told me about 15 years ago, uh, Janine said, who would give legislative testimony on a routine basis. She just said the following, says, Tom Blomberg, if I ever hear that you were giving legislative testimony and you're asked a question and you say, I don't have an answer for that, I've got to do more research, don't come home. She said, they have to make decisions now. They can't wait for you to do more research, so tell them what you know and what you don't know. Mm -hmm. So again, I think that's my regret, having not spent, here I am in Tallahassee for the last 38 years, I could have spent so much more time down there and learned so much more, but uh, I thought I, I thought I knew. I didn't recognize how little I did know. Well, you know, and I'll echo what he was just talking about. You just gotta, because there is that them and us kind of a thing, and you think that all these decisions are made outside your control. I can't tell you how easy it is to go to a Senate committee, write your name down on a list that you wanna speak and hand it to somebody and then they go through the cha the chairman of that committee goes through the thing and calls your name and you get up and tell your story, you know. And and just as he said, there's there's people in there that are come from a banking background and they come from an insurance background, they come from a, uh, a educational background and so forth and so on. They don't know the field of criminology other than our nemesis, the TV and movies that tell them what it's all about. And you'll just have to get through the whole thing about the jokes about getting a ticket and all the rest of those kinds of things that they like to bring up because that's their image and it's a very narrow one so what what your charge is here is to widen that image and let me tell you uh, what we can do for the betterment of in our case the state of Florida or in a city commission the city our city and how we can how we and in our field can help make it a better, uh, like I talked about before, a, a better uh, quality of life and that sort of thing. That speaks to people. And a lot of people, we get in our little silos, you know, and we're very protective about that. Mm. Uh, but we have got to uh, break those down and, and realize that, you know, uh, people don't, we, we make a lot of assumptions about people and most of those assumptions are, are in error. We will now conclude our panel discussion. I would like to thank Dr. Murdoch, Senator Ulrich, and Dean Blomberg for joining us today. Okay. Thank you. And thank you for attending today's Criminology in Context. We now invite you to join us in the lobby for refreshments. Yeah,